So let's talk about the shape of water today, shall we? So we're doing things a little bit differently this time. I know I said in my last video that my next video was going to be about jellyfish and sea anemones, but I was looking at what my schedule was going to be like over the holidays and I had a bad feeling I wasn't going to be able to release it in time, but I wanted y'all to have something for this month. So I decided to make a much less researched and much less polished video. So. I hope you like it. Jellyfish and anemones will definitely come next month, I promise. But this video is also an opportunity for me to talk about something I've been wanting to talk about for a while now because I think it's really interesting. Salinity. Where are you going? No, wait, no, come back. No, I promise this is interesting. I promise, I promise. All right, so for those who don't know, The Shape of Water is a 2017 movie directed by Guillermo del Toro, and I know I'm butchering his name, I apologize. And for those who haven't seen it yet, beware, here there be monsters. Sorry, I meant spoilers. But also monsters. It takes place in the 1960s and it's about a mute woman named Eliza who works as a cleaner at a government facility which has recently captured a strange and monstrous fishman. And Eliza and the fishman fall in love and she and her ragtag team of misfit friends and allies then need to figure out how to help him escape back into the ocean so that he can go home. But we're not here to talk about the plot of this film, we're here to talk about me, the marine biologist in the title of this video. Let's talk about how I figured out where the fishman actually came from. All right, so we got three clues to mermaid man's origins. One, he's from South America, not the Amazon. Some people have said to me, I thought he came from the Amazon. Nope. To quote the actual monster of the film, this guy, Strickland. I dragged that filthy thing out of the river muck in South America all the way here. Okay, cool. We got a whole continent to work with. And I know some of you right now are probably like, no, wait, the fishman has to be from the Amazon River. Strickland said he dragged him from river muck, which, yes, Strickland may have found the fishman in the Amazon, but there's no way he could have lived there because of clue number two. The fishman is kept in water at salinity levels between, um, Oh, um, hmm. I thought I wrote it down. Uh, Dr. Hofstetler, what salinity levels did you say? My name is Dimitri. Oh, for real? Okay, cool. Dimitri, just a really quick question for you. Honored to meet you. Oh, it's nice to meet you too. Anyway, what did you say were the salinity levels for the fish man? This water must be kept at five to eight percent salinity. Five to five to eight percent? Are you are you sure about that, Dimitri? That's really high. You have to go. Oh, okay, I'll go. I'm sorry. I learned about salinity using the units PPT or parts per thousand. So converting percentages into parts per thousand, we learned that the fish man is kept at 50 to 80 parts per thousand salinity, which is so absurdly high. And I imagine some of you right now are like, is, is that, is that absurdly high? Since I'm going to guess a lot of you don't have any reference for this, but yes, it is absurdly high. The ocean is on average about 30 parts per thousand salinity. At its saltiest, the ocean can get to be 38 parts per thousand. So 50? 50 parts per thousand salinity at a minimum for the fish man. Absurdly high. So he can't be from the Amazon River because the Amazon River is a river. It's freshwater, very low to no salt in it at all. I know the Amazon River does meet the ocean, so you can maybe argue that's where the fish man hung out, but that doesn't make any sense either because again, the saltiest that water could be would be 38 parts per thousand. And it wouldn't even be at 38 parts per thousand because it would be mixing with freshwater and... <laughs> Also, this is a huge salinity range. When I worked in aquariums, we kept most of our salt water tanks at around 30 parts per thousand, except for our coral tanks, they'd be kept at around 35 parts per thousand. And if they climbed like two to three parts per thousand, which happened regularly, evaporation is a thing. And when water evaporates from a salt water tank, it doesn't take the salt with it. So salinity levels go up. But if our tanks climbed two to three parts per thousand, we'd immediately throw some fresh water into it to bring it back down. The thought of my coral tanks getting to 38, 39, 40 parts per thousand is... Uh, Good. I've been at the fish keeping game for a while now, but even just the thought of one of my tanks reaching 40 parts per thousand salinity is almost literally something out of a nightmare. I'm pretty sure I've had nightmares about that before. So when I first watched this movie and they said the fish man was kept at 5 to 8 percent salinity level, I was like, oh, he's not from a real place. The writers just picked random numbers. But then the next morning, because I couldn't stop thinking about this movie, I was furiously Googling where in the world can water get to be 80 parts per thousand salinity? And Google was helpfully like, no, Google. And, and Google was helpfully like, saltwater lakes, obviously. And not gonna lie, I'm a little salty. I didn't realize that myself. Oh! -ho! Subscribe for more excellent jokes like this. But saltwater lakes or hypersaline lakes can easily get to like 
400 parts per thousand, and their salinity levels can fluctuate wildly, so he must have come from one of those. And when I was looking up salt lakes located in South America, I found Laguna Verde in Bolivia, which, if you can guess from its name, is bright green. And it's bright green because of lead, sulfur, arsenic, and calcium carbonates that have dissolved into the water, which explains clue number three, the crystals that need to be added to the fish man's water that turn it green. They must be crystallized forms of these metals and minerals. So there you have it. I, a marine biologist, have figured out that the fish man from the shape of water came from Laguna Verde in Bolivia, South America. But how does he get to the Amazon? Huh? How does he get to the Amazon? He has to get to the Amazon. The people there worship him. That's where they found him. Oh, uh, you know, he must walk there. Or maybe he swims along a bunch of different connecting rivers. The Amazon is over 2,000 kilometers away from Laguna Verde, and that's if he just travels in a straight line, which doesn't seem possible. Uh, well, uh... And why would he go all the way over there? Oh, uh, because it's like, it's like he said, indigenous people of the Amazon worshipped him. But there are indigenous people in Bolivia. Surely they'd have some appreciation for a creature like him. He can heal people just by touching them. Well, well yeah, and but... what was all that stuff about needing to pressurize the fish man? Pre Pre uh, pressurize? They said they needed to get him pressurized, remember? No, uh, no, no. Let me show you the clip. Oh, no, that's not necessary. I only- Put him in the tank. Let him pressurize. Well, it's obviously because Laguna Verde in Bolivia has an elevation of over four kilometers. So when they brought him down to sea level, they needed to uh, pressurize him because of the uh, difference but in- But they didn't bring him from a mountain in Bolivia. They brought him from a river in the Amazon, presumably the Amazon River. Also, wouldn't he need to be depressurized, not pressurized? W uh, I mean- You don't actually know where the fish man came from, do you? No, I don't. But that's okay. I honestly don't really care where he came from. I mean, I cared enough in the sense that I wanted to see if I could figure it out, you know, just for fun. But I'm not like a huge fan of this kind of media analysis, if you can even call it that, where people seem to take everything that's happening in the story really literally, and anything that seems even a little bit out of line and doesn't make sense in the story is considered a plot hole and therefore bad. So like, the fact that the fish man supposedly came from the Amazon River, but everything about the habitat they're keeping him in at the government facility doesn't support that, that would be bad and therefore make this a bad movie, which it's very much not. There's an intelligent fish man who understands what love is and can heal you with his touch. And people are getting hung up on, you know, this stuff? The water in the tub is already almost at the top, but Eliza has time to wander out into the living room, then the kitchen, allowing for the establishing shot of the theater below, then cook some eggs before she gets in. This floor should be leaking well before it does later in the movie. Seriously? The story in The Shape of Water isn't supposed to be taken literally, it's supposed to be a metaphor. It's it's a metaphor about what it feels like to be an outcast from society based on characteristics you can't control, like the color of your skin, your sexual orientation, your nationality, your gender, your disability, and your fish manness. It's about trying to survive inside systems that are designed to keep you at the bottom of them and finding little victories where you can, whether that's just taking a smoke break when you're not supposed to or falling in love. I watched this movie again recently and I just really love it. I love how everything's got this green tint to it so it looks like you're looking in a Aquarium. How they made the fish man skin glow with bioluminescent plankton. I really love that. I love that so much. I love that the good guys, the ragtag team of misfits who helped Eliza and the fish man escape, are a black woman, a gay man, and a communist who were all public enemy number one in 1960s America. I love how Del Toro took the iconic imagery of the fish man plunging into dark water with a young and beautiful woman in his arms and turned it from something that was supposed to be scary and terrifying. Well, I'm sure it was scary and terrifying in the 1950s and made it beautiful and heartbreaking. And it was actually really fun to go digging around to see if I could figure out if the fish man really came from an actual place. And I just wanted to share what I found, even if it is just to show y'all pictures of salt lakes, because like, look at them. They look dope! If you haven't seen The Shape of Water, and if anything I've said about it so far sounds interesting to you, then maybe check it out. It is a weird movie, I will admit. I mean... The main character has sex with a fish man, but it makes sense in context, and it's a really beautiful film. It's beautiful to look at, the story is really touching, and the acting in it is incredible. Doug Jones in particular, he plays the fish man. He does a really good job of making him, like, you kind of get where Eliza's coming from, you know? Like, I'm not gonna hit that, but I get it, girl. I see that cake. <laughs> I see that fish cake. <laughs> Stupid. Also, can I just point out, because I haven't heard anyone else say this, but if I had a nickel for every time Doug Jones played an intelligent fishman character who ate eggs, I'd have 
I mean, I only have two nickels, but still, that's more nickels than you would expect from a single actor. Alternatively, if you have seen it and you want to hear actual good film analysis of The Shape of Water, I'd recommend Lindsay Ellis' video about movie monster boyfriends, Innuendo Studios' video about Del Toro's films, and this newer one by Quality Culture. They're all really good, and if you watch any of them, you'll probably notice I stole some of their talking points because these creators are much more articulate than me. Anyway, that's all for now. Um, I guess like, comment, share, subscribe, watch my old videos and so on and so forth. I got a Patreon too, where if you sign up, you'll get stuff like your name in the credits at the end of each video, early access to videos, or access to my Patreon feed where I post behind the scenes stuff. And yeah, I hope everyone is enjoying the holidays or at the very least having a warm and safe winter season. And tune in next time. We will definitely be talking about jellyfish and sea anemones in the usual format. And until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood octopus lady reminding you that you don't need to go into space to find aliens? I'm not sure this outro really fits with this video. <laughs>